Welcome to part two of my American Electric Football League Solitaire rule set. In part one, we went over the setup and running plays. In this installment, we will go over the passing game. In part one, I explained how the offense comes out in the same formation on each play with the defense set to match. So I will not be reviewing that part in this video. Instead, I would refer you back to the first video if you have questions. I will merely restate that the reason that the offense and defense always comes out in the same formation is to expedite gameplay. And I'll also restate that the decision to run or pass will be based on dice rolls and game situations, which will be a topic covered in a later video. I do have a lot of content to review today since the passing game involves multiple stops and pivots and rules, unlike a running play, which is a lot less complex. However, despite all the information I'm going to present, I think you're going to see that it ties together pretty smoothly when I run a couple of full practice plays near the end of the video. As we begin, please note the position of the referees on the far sideline because where they are standing are reference features that mark the stops on a pass play. You'll see one referee stands one yard behind the line of scrimmage, and the deep referee is standing 15 yards behind the line of scrimmage. As the play unfolds, we'll be going back to those markers. Just like a run play, the first stop occurs when the quarterback and the halfback either meet or when their bases, the point at which their bases pass each other. Now I'm going to hit the switch and we're going to look at what happens on first stop. Okay, at this point, the quarterback and the halfback have met. So in a running play, the quarterback would be pivoted out of the way. It's just the opposite on a pass play. Now we are going to pivot the running back out of the quarterback's way, but in a manner that the running back can be involved in the play as a receiver. So at this point, when pivoting the running back out of the way of the quarterback's drop back, you're going to note the running back's helmet in relation to the quarterback's helmet. If the halfback's helmet is to the right of the quarterback's helmet, then you pivot him to the right. If his helmet is to the left of the quarterback's helmet, then you pivot him to the left. Once you pivot the running back, he's naturally going to be angled towards the sideline. And what you want to do is if he's on the right side of the quarterback, you want to point him to the first down marker on the far sideline. And if he's pivoted to the left of the quarterback, the same area on the near sideline. If the running back and quarterback pass each other without touching, there is no pivot for the running back. Now that previous example is all fine and good when the running back and quarterback meet relatively head on. You know, if his helmet's on this side of the quarterback, he turns that way towards the sticks. And if he meets and his helmet is on this side of the quarterback, he turns this way towards the sticks. But there are going to be occasions where the quarterback Let's say he's angled like this. He comes back. When they impact, he angles like that. And then the halfback's on this side of his helmet. And if you turn him that way, now he's blocking the quarterback's path. So if you ever run into a situation like that, you want to make sure that you angle the halfback out of the path of the quarterback. So something like this doesn't happen. He gets... On his drop back, he gets turned around. Now also at first stop, you're going to look at the defensive backs and the relation to the receivers going out for a pass. 
And then you're going to pivot the defensive backs from the back of the base. And you see how if I keep doing that, he's going to impact the receiver. We don't want that. So you pivot him as far as you can, and then you move him, and you move the defensive back so he's at the same angle going out as the receiver. Here's the safety. You're going to do the same thing. And once again, if I keep going, he's going to impact the way the receiver's going. So you then you adjust the rest from the front. Over here, it's not much of a problem. I'm just going to pivot him from the back, going out the same way. This corner going out here. Now, I'm going to do something real quick. Let's say on that first stop that the corner was touching the, the uh, wide receiver. Well, in that case, you would look at where his helmet is in relation to the receiver. It's, if it's on this side, you would take him and put him on that corner. If he's touching him and his helmet's on that side of the receiver, you'd place him on this corner of the receiver. And then if he was in the middle, you just would put him right in front. So let's just put him there because I forget where he was. Okay. And those are all the moves that happen at first stop. In my rules, a quarterback cannot pass at first stop. His first opportunity to pass will come at second stop, which is typically achieved when the quarterback drops back 15 yards from the line of scrimmage. That's where the deep referee comes into play. He marks that 15-yard second stop line. Now that all the first stop pivots have been made, we'll cut the board back on and see if the quarterback can get 15 yards back. He does. And at this point, right before he looks for an open receiver, we make one more pivot. Now, the very first thing you do at second stop is you look at where the halfback is. You can see he's now at the 50-yard line. You're going to pivot the closest defender to guard him, regardless if the defensive player is engaged with an offensive player or not. It's the only time in the game I allow that to happen. Normally, it is the linebacker. But the defensive end is in better position. You will note where the back of the defender's base is and pick him up, turning him in the opposite direction from the point where the back of his base was. After that pivot, you will survey the field for open receivers. Now, I will be doing a deep dive into open receivers later in the video, but just on quick examination, I see one guy open right away. Can you spot him? If you said this guy, you are correct. He is behind all the defensive players, and his path to catch the ball is clear in front of him and in bounds. Now, my rules state that if a quarterback has an open receiver at either stop two or stop three, he must throw the pass, which would involve us simulating the pass and then pivoting defenders to defend against the pass. But let's say, for example, 86 had him covered. And let's just say that all the receivers were covered. What happens now? With everyone covered, the quarterback's next and final attempt to pass will be to reach third stop. You will pivot the quarterback from the back of the base to go straight upfield, regardless of who is in his way. To reach third stop, the quarterback will have to move forward to within one yard of the line of scrimmage. And that point is marked by that referee on the far sideline. So now we'll activate the switch and see if the quarterback can reach third stop. So you see that the quarterback 
reach the third stop. And we would once again look for an open receiver. And just like on second stop, if the quarterback has an open receiver, he has to throw to him at that point. For the sake of this example, we're going to pretend like all his receivers are covered still, even though it's obvious when you look around the field, he's got guys open all over the place. After third stop, if all the receivers are still covered or otherwise ineligible, like being out of bounds, then the quarterback will scramble. The one exception to all this is if a receiver is open on third down or end of game and will clearly be going out of bounds short of the goal line or end zone, then the quarterback can scramble if he still has a shot to make the line the game. On the quarterback scramble, the quarterback must remain on the path that he was headed at the end of third stop. But you'll pivot any unengaged defenders to try to intercept him. Defenders that are engaged with each other are fine to be pivoted as well, as long as they're not engaged with an offensive player. Anytime the quarterback is moving forward, he's subject to all the running back tackling rules that I went over in the previous video. In this example, he gets by several defenders and turns on his own at the 40-yard line before running out of bounds, giving him forward progress at the 40-yard line. We are now going to begin to look at a couple scenarios where the drop back two stops, one, two, and three, don't go as planned. You may remember during the running game video on stop one, if when the quarterback and running back meet, if the running back falls over, it turns into a broken play and it becomes a passing play. Well, just the opposite is true during a passing play if the quarterback falls over. If that occurs, then it's a broken play and becomes a running play. And the running back would carry the ball from that point. It's also a broken play if when the running back and quarterback meet, the quarterback is immediately forced in a forward direction. Very unlikely. But if it does occur, it's also a broken play and becomes a running play. The running back carries the ball at that point. The next thing we're going to go over is when the quarterback cannot drop to that 15-yard depth mark that is usually required to achieve second stop. In this case, first stop goes fine, pivot to running back, but as the quarterback tries to hit that 15-yard depth mark marked by that referee, he instead turns short of that and turns even slightly towards the line of scrimmage. Well, that would be second stop right there. And if he has a receiver open, he has to throw at that point. Now, if he doesn't have anybody open, he's going to have to try to get the third stop before he can pass again. But since he's already turned slightly towards the line of scrimmage, he does not get that straight pivot upfield. Instead, you allow him to remain on the course he is, and one of several things is going to happen. He is either going to turn it upfield and get to third stop, which is that point one yard behind the line of scrimmage, or is going to turn in a negative direction, and that would be third stop. If that happens, and he doesn't have anyone open, it's a coverage sack. And the other thing that can happen is he travels all the way over, doesn't hit that one yard mark before the line of scrimmage, doesn't turn around, but he travels over and hits the hash marks. That's third stop. And at that point, once again, if he doesn't have any receivers open, it would be a coverage sack and he'd be down right there. Of course, the defense has some say about what's going to happen too when the quarterback's back here trying to get to his different stops. For example, as a quarterback 
travels in a negative direction to achieve first stop and second stop. At any time, a defensive player can break through. And since the quarterback's already traveling in a negative direction, if the defensive player touches his base with the front or side of the defensive player's base, that is a sack. If he hits the back of the quarterback's base, that's a strip sack fumble, and you would go to the fumble procedure. Anytime the quarterback moves forward after second stop, he follows running back tackling procedure rules. In other words, the defensive player would have to force him in a negative direction for him to be considered tackled. Another thing that can happen is if at the time the switch is cut off at third stop, the quarterback is engaged with at the front or side of a defender's base, he cannot throw. And then the only way he could still throw at third stop is if he broke contact with the defensive player and didn't go fully over the line of scrimmage. If he can't break contact with the defensive player as he f goes fully over the line of scrimmage, it'll turn into a quarterback scramble. Let me go over another scenario here where a quarterback only gets two stops. Okay, here goes first stop. It goes fine. You pivot the running back. But what happens is the quarterback, instead of hitting the 15-yard depth mark for second stop, drifts all the way over, doesn't turn in a doesn't turn towards the line of scrimmage, but drifts all the way over and hits the hash mark. That's going to be considered second stop, and it's going to be his only chance to pass. If he has nobody open at that point, it's a coverage sack. He's down there. Here's another scenario. First stop goes good. Second stop goes good. Has nobody open, let's say. Gets pivoted upfield. Starts to run. And as he goes upfield, he turns in a negative direction. If he has someone to throw to, he throws the pass then. If his receivers are covered, it's a coverage sack. And here's another scenario. Once again, first stop goes good. Second stop goes good. Nobody open. Pivot the quarterback. He runs. And he either runs all the way to the sideline on this side or all the way to the sideline on that side. If he does either one, as soon as he hits those sideline hash marks, he has to throw a pass if he has a receiver open. If he doesn't have anyone open, it's a coverage sack. He's down there. Now I'm going to go over how I simulate the forward pass. I do use passing sticks, which is a term that's going to be familiar to veterans of electric football. But I'm going to go over the concept in detail for those new to the hobby. Veterans may want to hang in there as well, as I've added a few twists that work well for my solitaire rule set. The passing sticks allow us to simulate a forward pass from the quarterback to the receiver using a multi-step process. Using this method, a ball never physically travels through the air. Instead, we begin by using this stick, we'll call the range stick, and you see it's evenly divided into a red color and a white color. And you place the red portion over the center of the quarterback's head and you point it to the receiver you're going to throw to. If the receiver's helmet falls within the red range, it's a short pass. If he falls within the white range, it's a medium pass. And if he falls in an area outside the length of this range stick, it's a long pass. Once you have identified whether the pass you're throwing to the receiver is a short, 
medium, or long pass. You'll then begin to use these sticks, which are color coded to match the short, medium, and the blue stick is the long pass. So how do you use these? Well, let's say for example, we place a stick here and the receiver is clearly within the red stick range. You then take the corresponding small red stick, you place it in front of his base like so, and then you take a target ball, and I made this out of some evergreen hobby tubing, a matte magnet wedged underneath to hold it onto the board, and the clay ball that I glued on top. You then place the target ball up against the stick, like so. You then remove the stick, and you activate the board. If the receiver touches the stick with the front of his base, or part of his figure, like his hand, the pass is complete. The pass is not complete if he hits it with the side or back of his base, except in special circumstances. If the pass is completed, you would remove the target ball so the receiver can move forward unimpeded. Now, in my rules, normally a receiver is not pivoted in any way before or after the catch. He's left on the course he's going. But before the switch is activated for the initial reception, any defenders in the area are pivoted towards the ball to try to defend the catch. Remember that if a receiver catches a pass, he turns into a runner and is subject to the running back tackling rules covered in my first video. Also note that normally defensive players do not get a second after catch pivot, except in a special situation that I will cover in a couple of minutes. If the receiver is beyond the red stick range, in the white range or the medium pass area, then a longer white stick is used as it's a more difficult pass to complete. And you'll see the comparison between the length of the white stick and the length of the red stick. And beyond the white stick medium pass range would be the most difficult pass to complete, and that would be the long stick, the blue stick. Now, as I have already stated in my rules, the receiver does not get a pivot either before the pass is thrown or after it's completed. He's left on the course he's going, whatever that is. There is one exception to that, though. If the receiver is open and faced in a negative direction or a comeback route, then you would line the receiver up with a target ball just as you would with a forward-facing receiver. Any free defenders would be pivoted towards the ball as well. Let's say after the board is activated, the receiver catches it. What I allow from that point is one straight pivot in a forward direction for the receiver. With any free defenders now allowed a second pivot to try to stop him. I do account for defensive pressure. I have this turquoise stick which measures two bases in length. Using this stick and measuring from the center of the quarterback's helmet, if the helmet of the closest defender falls within the length of the stick, an additional distance is added to the pass attempt. That additional distance is added to the base red, white, and blue sticks. The normal red stick becomes a red stick with pressure. The normal white stick becomes a white stick with pressure. And the normal blue stick becomes a blue stick with pressure. This results in additional difficulty in completing passes as the pressure adds about a half inch in length to each of the sticks. Now I want to go into the lengths of the passing sticks and range sticks I use because I have custom made mine to suit my gameplay and they are not the same lengths that Tudor Games uses which I believe are regulation for tournament play. To get the Tudor products 
you can visit TudorGames.com. If you just want the dimensions that are tournament approved to make your own, there's a wonderful site online called PlayEF.com where you can find that information. My measurements are based on the fact that I only run 32 plays in a game on a scale field and I want a higher completion percentage and more scoring. We'll start with the range stick. This is 20 inches long total, 10 inches on the red side and 10 inches on the white. The base red stick is an inch and a quarter. The red stick with pressure is an inch and three quarters. The base white stick is two inches. The white stick with pressure is two and a half inches. The base blue stick is three and a half inches. The blue stick with pressure is four inches. The length of the turquoise pressure stick is roughly equivalent to two flat front ITZ bases, which comes out to about two and an eighth inch. As I have previously mentioned, my rules state that the quarterback has to throw to the first open receiver at stops two or three. So what is an open receiver? Let's define it now. The open receiver is easy to see in this example. The Virginia Pirate player in the black jersey is behind the two Texas Tornado players in this example, we're going to assume that the two Texas Tornado players are the only defenders, and they are clearly behind the front plane of that Virginia Pirate. Also, the target ball area in front of him would be in bounds, and none of his own players are in the way. The situation gets a little more complicated when there are defenders, even with or over top the receiver. So that is why I developed these coverage circles. This one is for the receivers in the red range, the short pass range. And this one is for the receivers in the white medium pass range. I don't have one for the blue range right now, but that's not important. Let me show you how they work. If you have a receiver or receivers in the red short pass range, you would use this red circle. And line it up in front of his helmet, center it in front of his helmet, and it's very simple. If the defender's helmets are outside the coverage circle, he's open. If you put this down, and the coverage circle covers his helmet in any way, even just a little bit, he's not open. Open, not open. Open, you can throw to him. There, you can't throw to him. And the same thing goes with the white range, receivers in the white range. The defender's helmets are outside. You can throw to him. If you're covering part of the defender's helmet, you can't throw to him. I'm going to explain to you now why the circles work, and I'm just going to show you with the red circle because the same principle will apply to the white circle and a circle for the blue stick as well. Like I said, I'm using the red circle for any receiver who is in the red range. And as I've gone over before, the longest pass that you can throw in the red range is a red stick with pressure. So this being the longest pass, I use this length to measure the diameter of the circle. And what I do is I did one stick, red stick with pressure, plus the length of the ball, or the width of the target ball, plus another length of the red stick with pressure plus an extra three quarters of an inch and that's what makes the difference okay because if you look at this up against the plier here and this 
is the distance the receiver would travel to catch the ball. And here's a defensive player and his helmet. If this is an open receiver, his helmet is always going to be outside the circle. So that being the case, the defender will always have to travel that stick length plus an extra distance to get to the ball. So that's why if the defender's helmet is outside the circle, no matter where he is around the circle, the receiver will always be closer to the ball than he is. Now, veterans of the hobby, or those that are just familiar with the figures or good with math, might say, well, in your example there, you've got the circle on the field measuring base to front of base. But in your gameplay, you're measuring between the helmets. Bases stick out in front of helmets. Won't that mess up your formula? No, it won't. Because the three-quarter of an inch accounts for that, and I'll show you. So for the sake of this example, I'm going to use two players with bullet bases. Bullet bases, by far, have the most pronounced distance between the helmet and the front of the base. And since both players have them, they'll represent the most extreme case for my example. So here we're going to center the red circle right in front of the receiver's helmet, and I got the defender as close as I possibly can with his helmet clearly still outside the circle. Here's the red pressure stick right up against the receiver's base with the target ball flush up against the stick. And as you can see, there's the defender. We put the stick flush up against his base and you can clearly see there is a little room and he is clearly further away from the ball than the receiver. And hey, this would be a very dangerous pass, but very often margins for open receivers and the pros are very narrow. So as you can see, if you use my methodology in creating your own coverage circles, they do work. Other scenarios where the receiver is not open is interference from a teammate. In this example, the receiver's teammate is in his target ball path. If his target ball path is blocked, the receiver is not open. If two receivers are open but in contact with each other, they are ineligible to catch a pass. If the receiver's catch point is out of bounds, the receiver is not open. However, it should be noted that if any part of the target ball is still in the field of play, such as in this example, where a sliver of the stick is just in bounds, then the receiver can still make the catch if he is in bounds when he hits the stick. Also in my rules, defenders who are out of bounds can be turned to affect an inbounds play. So when you're using the coverage circle, you have to account for them. When checking to see if a receiver is open, even defenders who are engaged with another player, whether it be an offensive player or their own teammate, still have the receiver covered if they fall underneath the coverage circle, as in this case. Even though the defensive player here is in contact with an offensive player and can't be pivoted to make a play on the ball, during the course of the play, he could slip off and intercept the pass. And... If it's two defensive players in contact, they can be disengaged to make a play on the ball. Let's talk about interceptions. I'll start off by recapping the defensive player's pivots as we simulate the pass. So when a receiver is open, either by being in front of the defender in this case, or being open using the coverage circle after the target ball is placed in front of the receiver and after the stick is removed but before the switch is activated for the receiver to catch the pass just like i have showed you before any unengaged defensive players can be pivoted towards the target ball if they're engaged with a teammate they can be pivoted they can't be pivoted 
if they were engaged with an offensive player. It's important to note that just as in professional football, a defensive player has every right to the football as an offensive player. If the defensive player is faster, then he has every right to intercept that ball away from the offense. If he touches it with the front of his base or part of his figure like his hand before the offensive player can hit the stick, then it is an interception. If the receiver and the defender hit the ball simultaneously, the pass is deflected and it's incomplete. Also, if the defender intercepts the ball and he's not engaged with an offensive player, but he's turned in a negative direction upon intercepting it, then he can be pivoted straight and the offensive players can be pivoted to try and stop him. So the defender can intercept the ball if he gets to the target ball before the offensive player. But also, let's say the receiver runs past the ball. As soon as he runs past it, you stop the board. And if a defender is, and we're going to break out that, this is that pressure stick, right? We're also going to use it as an interception gauge, right? What we're going to do is we're going to line it up over the target ball, and if the defender's helmet is within that stick at the point where the receiver passes the target ball, then he is eligible to intercept it. Now, whether he does from that point or not is up to him. He could miss it too. But any defender within that stick as the receiver runs by is eligible for an interception try. It's still possible for the offense to complete a pass in this situation if an unintended receiver is within that turquoise stick range and pointed at the ball. He's eligible to catch it and advance the ball for the offense. So I think I mentioned before that if a receiver hits the target ball at the front of his base or some part of his figure like his hand, the pass is complete. But not if the side of his base or the back of his base touches. Incomplete. However, I do allow a receiver to catch the ball if his one of his teammates pushes him into the target ball on side of base, but never the back of base. The same thing goes with a defensive player. That's an interception. That's an interception. This, this, and this are not. But if one of his teammates pushes him in on side, then that's an interception. Now, if the offensive player is pushed into it by a defensive player from the side, it's incomplete. And the same thing goes with a defensive player. If he's pushed into the ball side base by an offensive player, the pass is incomplete. I explained earlier that if you have a teammate in the way of the receiver's target ball path, then the receiver is not open. But there are scenarios that happen during the course of the game, that could happen during the course of the game, where the receiver's target ball path is clear, but you have an ineligible teammate that might get in the way of him catching the ball. When something like this occurs, what I allow is you to turn the ineligible receiver in a negative direction, straight in a negative direction, out of the way to prevent interference from the catch. You've heard me say multiple times during this video that the quarterback throws to the first open receiver on stops two or three. 
But what happens if he has multiple receivers open? In this scenario, I've got a bunch of receivers open. And I have a very simple rule for this. He throws to the deepest receiver downfield. Now it's time to look at how all of this flows together in actual full practice plays. I ran a bunch of practice plays for this video, and I handpicked four that all had different outcomes. Let's look at them now. As has been the case in the entire video, the Virginia Pirates black jerseys will be on offense, and the Texas Tornadoes in the red jerseys will be on defense. Here we go from the 50-yard line. We activate the switch. And here's first stop. Half back pivot to the sticks, pivot the corners and the safeties. All actions on first stop are now complete. Quarterback will now try to make it the second stop. He hits the 15 yard depth at second stop. We would normally pivot someone to cover the halfback, but he's engaged, so we can leave that alone. Now we will establish the range of the receivers and see if any of them are open. There's 45. He's a white stick. He's a white stick. Up top. 41 is a white stick, and I believe 87 is as well. So we look to see if any of these guys are open. 81. Do I even need to do it? No. 45. It looks like he may be barely open. 41 is not open, and neither is 87. Both covered by 37. But 45 is open. Looks like it's going to be a dangerous pass. Since the quarterback's not under any pressure, it's going to be a short white stick. So the slot back is going to get a chance here, but it is a dangerous pass since 86 is right there. Okay. And we'll pivot anybody that we can pivot for the defense. Let's see what happens, and it's intercepted. So right there, 86 picks off the pass, and you'd pivot him upfield because he was headed in a negative direction, and then you'd set these guys to play defense. Six would be down there. Interception. Let's run another play. Okay. Here we go. Oop. 31. Pivoted out of the way. This is first stop. Defensive backs get their pivots. Quarterback gets the second stop. Okay, so we have 31 here, the back out of the backfield, who is getting open. So now I can't take the linebacker and cover him. This one's too far away. It's ridiculous. So I take this guy, try to keep him in the same footprint. It's a defensive end. So it's a little bit of a mismatch. And let's just see at first stop if he's got anybody open. 81's a white stick. 45's a white stick. Looks like he's got the tight end streaking down the middle as a white stick. Also 87's a white stick. 31, the halfback's a red stick. So let's start checking to see if any of the white stick receivers are open. 81 is going to be covered like a blanket. 45 is obviously covered. 
41 is open. 87 is open by coverage circle, but he has 41 in his target path, so he's not open. And then, of course, 31. 31 is open as well, but if you recall my rules on multiple open receivers, the open receiver who is furthest down the field gets the pass. The quarterback's not under any pressure. It's going to be a short, so it's a short white stick. The, oh, there was some contact. 41 does catch the ball at the front of his base. The defensive contact was allowed because it was within a base length of the target ball. And 87 brings 41 down at the 29. Here's another play. Line of scrimmage at the 20 this time. First stop. Running back pivot. Safety and corner pivots. Quarterback looking to reach the five yard line for second stop. He gets there. So I normally pivot someone here to cover the running back, but he's so far out in his passing route that coverage may fall on the corner and safety. Let's see how far he is, what stick he is, what range he is. He's a white stick, as all the receivers are here at second stop. So let's see who's covered. It looks like, well, running back's covered, as are all the receivers in front of him. And over on this side, it looks like they're all covered. With no receivers open at second stop, the quarterback will get one straight pivot to go upfield and reach third stop, which is typically one yard behind the line of scrimmage, in this case the 19. Now once again, we will look to see what range his receivers are in and if any of them are open. These receivers are in the short red range, but they're touching each other. They are ineligible. On the other side of the field, the tight end is in the white range, and he appears to be covered by the safety in the corner. The wide receiver on the far side of the field and the running back are also in the white medium pass range. The running back is open, and it also looks like the wide receiver, yes, he is open. And he's the furthest one downfield. He's getting the pass. You can see the quarterback is under pressure from the closest defensive player, which will make this a longer white stick pass. You can see as I line this up, with that corner over top, this is a dangerous pass. Wow, 87 just beats the corner to the ball. Now let's see what he can do. Eighty-seven just blows by the defense. We'll turn the camera upfield. Let's see if he can stay in bounds. Ignore that flag on the field. There is no penalty. Except maybe on me for leaving that clutter all over the place. 80 yards for 87. Touchdown. I'll show you one more play. This was from the 45, by the way. First stop went well. 
the running back and defensive backs getting their pivots. Quarterback has to make it to the 30th time. Linebacker charging in on a blitz, but the quarterback made it to second stop, so now we'll check the range of the receivers and if any of them are open. We'll pivot this defensive player to cover the running back, even though the running back's ineligible because he's got a offensive lineman in his target path. Receivers in the white range up top, red range for the running back, but I already went over why he is ineligible. White range for the receivers down here, but they are also ineligible due to the fact they are in contact with each other. The tight end and the wide receiver on the far side are covered. The quarterback will try to make it the third stop. One straight pivot upfield, and boom! The linebacker lays some wood on him. If he can break contact, he can make it to third stop, either at the 44 or at the hash mark. But 43 rides him out to 41, sacking him. Now we'll cover a scenario where the offense is backed up to their 10-yard line. And what I've been saying is that the second stop line is always marked by that far referee, 15 yards from the line of scrimmage. Now, in this case, 15 yards would be at the midway point of the end zone since the end zone itself is 10 yards wide. So when the quarterback's dropping back, you merely have to keep an eye on the quarterback in relation to that far referee to make sure he's hit that mark. Now when the offense is backed up from their nine yard line back to their goal line, I would refer you to the running game video for the position of the halfback since the running plays and the passing plays all look the same. However, the difference is that on the passing play, we've got to find a spot for the quarterback to achieve second stop. And for that, from the nine on back, I just measure two yards from the corner and then place the far referee there. Now, I have my red stick happens to be two yards on my scale field exactly. So I always give the quarterback that two yards of uh, clearance from the back from the end line. This will conclude part two. In part three, I will review how I handle kickoffs, extra points, field goals, punts, and onside kicks. In part four, I will review game management procedures. I explain how many plays I run, how I decide runner pass plays, and other decisions based on game situations. I will also review penalties in part four. None of those videos will be as lengthy as this one. Thanks for hanging in there. And I hope that I have presented some ideas you can use in your gameplay, or at the very least helped you to understand the gameplay that you see on my channel. See you in the next video.